<coughs> we have about 20 minutes, so why don't we take questions and you can just answer them as they go. Oh, oh yeah, sure, so absolutely. <laughs> All right, so let me respond very briefly. Thanks very much, Fatih, for a fantastic discussion. It was, it was, it was really fascinating. Um, so let me just take your three points in order. So um, the first one about the kurtosis, so that the, uh, that the innovations don't look normal. Instead, there, a lot of the times, but most of the time, nothing happens. And then every now and then, you get these huge shocks. Um, we've actually thought about this. And there's actually something in the paper. Maybe it's so well hidden in the, in the appendix that it was sort of a bit obscure. Um, and my my. My prior, when we started uh, thinking about this, was actually that this would help a lot with generating faster transitions of, of the cross-sectional distribution. Um, but we sort of worked it out, um, and it actually doesn't help at all. If anything, it makes the transitions um, slower. Um, the one case uh, where it would help is if you have shocks that are more fat-tailed than the actual cross-sectional income distribution itself, but that kind of doesn't make any sense. So that so that that wouldn't help. So if suddenly the, the fatness of the shocks, like the fat tailedness of the shocks, increases a lot, that would help. Um, the way we modeled this was actually exactly one of your suggestions. So this mandel broad double Pareto distribution. Um, so that doesn't work. Um, but we should definitely explore your subordinated stochastic processes. I thought that was something I never heard of. That I thought that was a really interesting thought. So uh, thanks for that suggestion. Um, regarding the second point, that so we had this experiment where we fed in this this increase in volatility, um, and it's not actually there in the in the in the good data. Um, so I fully agree with that. So I, I, I the only reason why we did this experiment was that sort of in the simple version of the model, there aren't really any other parameters that you can shock, right? So there's there's really only like two parameters. One is the average growth rate. One is the the variance of these shocks, um, and and. There was some evidence in the literature that this increased, so that's why we did it. Um, in the end, our conclusion is that it kind of doesn't work anyway, right? So in a sense, it's, I mean, OK, fine. It's not even there, but even if it were there, it wouldn't work. So I mean, that's kind of the, the conclusion. Um, finally, uh, your third point, um, I mean, that we should track individuals. Um, I would love to track individuals. Uh, you should give me your data, and I will <laughs> happily track individuals. Um, and that's it. All right. But thanks very much overall. It was really fascinating. Also, the facts about firms, really cool stuff. Gabriel, did, did you want to say a couple of words, or should we ask for questions? Yeah, so, Amy? Check and, and so on. And, and my understanding of that paper is that it does use social security data, and that using this social security data argues that the uh, variance of these income shocks went up. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, relative to that paper, which uses the same data, what, 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 what is the difference here? Okay. Um, originally, I had some slides on that, but then uh, I had to cut my slides by half at the end because I realized I wouldn't uh, fit in there a lot of time. Um, w what seems to be happening, so the last, those numbers I showed you is going to be joint work with Luigi Pistaferi and Nick Bloom. And one thing that we find in, in this project is um, there is something that definitely is going up, but it is not the shock variance of uh, shocks hitting individuals over time. It is, there's a remarkable increase in the initial dispersion that different cohorts enter the labor market. So for example, you look at the cohort that entered in 1980, suppose that this is the initial dispersion, 81, 82, 83, 84. So that is a big part of the rise of inequality. I don't think that has been commented uh, in the literature. And when you do like Kopchuk Sae's song, which is, you know, uh, uh, it's a great paper, their results don't conflict with anything I said here because it, it combines that initial variance with shocks that you receive over the life cycle. When you disentangle them, actually, you see bigger cohorts entering with you know, larger variance, but the inequality is not rising any faster than before. But if that's the case, then can we not view that as a, as a form of labor income risk, that you enter the labor market and <coughs> potentially get? It's very different. That, that, that can just be like fixed initial differences. And at this point, you know, we don't really fully understand 
why it is, is it that they enter with such large inequality? And a lot of that is at the very top end. If you look at the median to 90 percentile gap, that gap has been growing every single year from 1980 to today for the first year that you enter the labor market. So I don't have a good theory of it. That's why I cannot directly answer, does it qualify as risk? Does it not? I don't know. <clears throat> For Gabriel, the, uh, the U.S. Survey of Consumer Finance does not consider um, funds and entitlements in Social Security as wealth. And I would think that money we have and are entitled to uh, from the Social Security funds is these days looking considerably safer than money we put into retirement accounts and pension funds. So. Do you uh, handle this in, in your, in your uh, non-SSA data set or uh, take it in, consider it? Um, yeah, so no, that's a very good question. So the, the way that I think is the correct way to deal with pension wealth is to include all uh, privately funded pension wealth. And that's what we do. So what we include in wealth is all, you know, uh, defined contribution pensions and all funded defined benefit pensions. What we exclude is unfunded defined benefit pensions and social security. The SCF excludes all defined benefit pensions, whether funded or not. So, in s so, so one thing is that we include more pension wealth than, than they do. From a conceptual perspective, I don't think it, it, it would be correct to include social security in wealth because if you do this, then you want to include the, the net present value of all future government transfers, net of taxes, and it's very unclear where to stop. You know, if you do this, the government promises to transfer you some money in the future, but the government also promises to you know, transfer you some money in the form of uh, health benefits, education, spending for your children, and also you're going to pay taxes in the future. So, you know, why do this only for Social Security and not for other transfers? I think it makes more sense to just say, well, wealth, it's, you know, tangible stuff that, that, that exists, you know, in the economy. So all funded wealth, uh, either DC or, or DB plans, and that's what we do. So uh, I have a question about the, the Social Security data. So is it picking up, you know, so obviously it's picking up the, the W-2 type data that's, that's uh, going to have self-employment tax or, you know, employment tax on it. But what about the, you know, because there's been a huge rise in the carried interest and stuff that comes through like on a K-1 that's not, it doesn't have self-employment tax. <coughs> so is it, is it missing all of that? Uh, uh, th thank you. That's actually a very important question about the top earners. Um, so th 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 there are several classes of income that we think of as capital income, but the IRS treats it as labor income. And I will uh, mention three of them. Uh, one is um, if you are awarded a non-qualifying stock option, and in the United States about 95% of all options granted to employees are non-qualifying, then when that option uh, uh, basically uh, vests, uh, it is reported in your W-2 as labor income. And the W-2 form has a box, 12B, I think. It will tell you the amount that, uh, the amount of your W-2 income that is actually a vested uh, option, uh, stock option. The second one is what is called uh, restricted stock units. Again, when those vest on the day of vesting, uh, the, the, the dollar value is reported as labor income. So for all those categories, we capture them. There is some that we don't, and you just mentioned one of them. So carried interest is treated as capital income. As far as I understand, I have talked to people, I have read on this, uh, so we don't have that. Um, my understanding is that's only, you know, for hedge fund managers, and even in hedge fund, it's like, you know, high-ranking uh, workers. But I think for a lot of the non-financial firms that we have, 
uh, CEO or executive compensation will be either non-qualifying stock option or restricted stock units, and they will be in our measure. And actually, I mean, I'm not allowed to quote any numbers, but there are some incredibly high wage income numbers that will blow your mind. So I, I don't think those are really wage income numbers. Those are actually wage income plus exercise stock option plus re restricted stock units. I'm sorry, I gave my microphone away, but one, uh... one other thing I think you might be missing is, you know, since the 86 Tax Act, a lot of, uh, there's a huge increase in S corporations. And with an S corporation, you have to pay a salary, but you have just have to make it reasonable, and then you can flow the rest of the in, in, income through through a K-1, and I don't believe that has self-employment, and I think Social Security would miss it, and I think that's a massive amount of money. You could check that by looking at the summary IRS statistics. So, so we, we have done that. Actually, in the paper with Greg, we have an appendix where we discussed that, and uh, I think we are really missing it for the top 0.01%. Because we have comparisons to some of the data that Piketty and Sias published, and Sias has on the website, it aligns very well up to the 0.01%. And there, there are some discrepancies because of the, the reasons you mentioned. <clears throat> so we have, I, do we have one more question in the back? No, so we have two questions here. So go ahead. Martin Feldstein at Harvard wrote an op-ed piece. And he said, if you, following your approach, if you take and capitalize the huge increase in benefits, earned income tax credits, and Social Security, and health care, et cetera, and add that wealth that the acclaimed growth of the wealth of the upper half or whatever actually wasn't more at all than that of the lower. In other words, it totally contradicts the liberal fashionable thesis where every article is supporting the idea that the inequality of wealth is exploding. These are huge numbers, and if you ask the poor people involved, the bottom half, they take that wealth very seriously. That's what provides their income. So I'm just curious, is this included anywhere? The capitalization, the, I should say the change in the wealth due to ever greater benefits that benefit the bottom half, not the half, not, not the upper half at all. Um, so, no, we do not capitalize transfers. And, you know, fine, you know, if you want to capitalize transfers, you can do this. This is very uncertain. You know, this, this depends enormously on, you know, uh, the rates of uh, capitalization that you're going to choose. And this is very, you know, we, we just, there's no agreement on how to do this. Excuse so me. I, I, in, in the last 35 years, where there's no uncertainty about what happened, that is the increase in such wealth that he was writing about, not how you capitalize it or what rate for the future. No, the, the point is, you know, wealth, uh, there's a clear definition of wealth, which is wealth for which there exists a market value and, and that you can sell on markets. That's our concept, uh, our concept of wealth. I think it's a well-defined starting point. It makes sense and it's objective in the sense that you have market prices. Then you're telling me, well, you know, if you have another concept of wealth that includes the present value of transfers, then the results might differ. Maybe, but one problem with this concept is that it's not really, you know, well defined in the sense that it's unclear which transfers you want to include. It's un there, are no, there, are, there are no observable market prices for that type of wealth. And so I think it's very, you know, it, it's less of a reliable starting point, at least. I think what makes sense is to look at income, at the distribution of pre-tax and pre-transfer income on the one hand, like Piketty says do, and the distribution of post-tax and post-transfer income on the one hand. That makes a lot of sense. That's very well defined. That I'm working on this right now. So I, I'll tell you the results when I have those. That, that makes sense. Uh, this is really a, a quick sub question about stock options again. It's when you have the, um, the vested share, which is usually going to be calculated on a Black-Scholes, right? That's what appears in the S1s, uh, in the uh, annual income statements by corporations, versus the realized gain, which may be a multiple, or it may be zero, uh, which would appear in the capital income. Is there any methodology for trying to reconcile 
between the notional value that the accountants make corporations put on the stock option or RSU compensation to executives versus the actual realized between the income and capital accounts of that in, in wealth and income in, in that respect? Uh, <clears throat> So a lot of my knowledge of this is by researching it. I'm not fortunate enough to actually have been granted any of these to know it firsthand. But my understanding is that um, it's true corporations report based on the Black-Scholes formula. But on the W-2, it is reported when you exercise it at the actual value, not based on the Black-Scholes formula. If it's incorrect, somebody can correct me. But that's my understanding of okay. how it's done. It's correct? OK. <clears throat> yes. So given your work so far, this is addressed to the panel, are there any um, qualitative concepts about capitalism that you can make at this point, and any policy implications? I'll is capitalism inherently <laughs> bad? <laughs> is there anything that we need to correct? <laughs> Well, I, I can point out something uh, small, which I m meant to say at the very end, and I, I ran out of time. Um, one very important implication of the work that Ben uh, 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 has been doing, basically, if different investors receive different rates of return, and that return differential is persistent, then there are actually very important policy implications of that. So. Um, not to advertise my work, but we are working on a paper, <laughs> I have to say it, I guess, uh, basically where we look at uh, the difference between two things that sound identical. One is capital income taxation, the other one is wealth taxation. So what's the difference between the two? Well, wealth taxation is on the stock of your wealth, not on the return that you make. So imagine, for example, that Ben is a great entrepreneur, he has a 20% return, I have 0%. Capital income taxation will all go to him. I won't pay a dime. But suppose we both have $10 million stock, wealth tax will tax both of us. And what we find is that there are huge efficiency gains, which sounds very you know, uh, counterintuitive. There are efficiency gains from taxing the stock of wealth rather than capital income, because if you do that, you are redistributing from rich, unproductive people like me to rich, productive people like Ben. So that's, I think, a sense in which, you know, it's a different look at capitalism, it's a different look at, at taxation, um, which is, I, I hadn't thought about before, that you can get efficiency gains by taxing wealth, which sounds almost contra, you know, counterintuitive. Do you think that, um, is there any observable uh, distinction between what the super wealthy earn on their capital um, and the, the mass uh, of a group of investors? Is it, and if there is a differentiation, is it because they're of their mean? own, yeah, and is it because of their own capital formation capabilities as opposed to investing in products that are out there in the marketplace? I mean, so uh, uh, Gabriel and uh, um, Emmanuel's work, such, you know, they have some evidence that the returns are not that different. Um, I think, again, that's an area that I personally believe we need microdata. There are two projects I'm aware of. One is by, uh, Luigi Pistaferi and Alberto Bissin using Norwegian data. In Norway, there's a wealth tax, so you can actually, and they kept very good track of the entire investment portfolio. And I'm doing some work on Swedish data, again with the same goal. Um, there's one paper by John Campbell on Swedish data where he does claim to find differences in rates of return that varies by education, by observable characteristics. But you know, a lot of the work that Ben and others are doing we are assuming, whether there's evidence or not, that there is heterogeneity across uh, investors in, in such returns. <clears throat> there are certain investment opportunities which are only open to very wealthy people. Like I have. I, I know someone very well, and I believe his, his immediate family's net worth is in the neighborhood of half a billion dollars. And, uh, and, and you know, there are certain investment opportunities where the minimum participation is $10 million or more. And someone, you know, at his level can join, but that's not available to, to just, you know, to 99.9% .9 of people.
I had a question for Fatih for one of the tables you showed. Um, this was kind of like I, in, interpreting this transition from uh, like whether you remain in the top bracket or not. And those probabilities had, have increased significantly for both men and women. That <coughs> data suggests that mobility has gone down over time. And I was curious because Raj Chetty has this work using some of similar data that argues that mobility has kind of remained the same. Uh, so, so, so um, I'll go back to the comment I made at the beginning. Like when we say mobility, so when we teach uh, you know uh, PhD students, we always say uh, the, the wealth distribution is an infinite dimensional object, right? We like saying that, and but it has some practical implications, and one of them is uh, it depends on what part of the distribution you look at for mobility. So it's right that I think you know I. I um, I actually completely buy their, 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 their study that uh, when you look at fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, when you look at parents and children, uh, over time across states you see remarkable stability in mobility. Ours is about the very top. And so again, the very top I think can be a bit different. And this is not about lifetime, remember. This is just one year ahead probability of you staying. Um, so theirs is intergenerational mobility. This is year to year mobility. And um, our interpretation is that, yes, mobility seems to have fallen for the top earners. We don't really, I mean, we interpret that somewhat negatively, that it became like a more entrenched group. Uh, but that is not backed by a lot of theory. It's just, you know, looking at the data, you, you, you seem to see that they are there much more often. Once you get in, you don't leave as, much, as quickly. <clears throat> I don't see any more questions in the audience, so I will take advantage and sort of I had one, one comment that I wanted to share. So I think it was a fascinating session with both very interesting papers and a great discussion by Fatih. So I, I was going to say that uh, for about 20 years, uh, sort of in, in one part of the literature, in the international trade literature, people have started paying attention to the role of firms and sort of what people have noticed is that a lot of the income inequalities actually doesn't happen within firms, but happens across firms. And sort of one of the distinct characteristics that firms have, for example, is whether the firms participate in international trade, and those firms tend to pay uh, fairly dramatically different wages from firms that don't participate in trade. And so I was kind of curious if we know more of the firm characteristics, which make them pay higher wages relative to other firms, and sort of how exactly this can be consistent with a labor market equilibrium that some firms pay so much higher wages than others. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if, yeah. if, if you have information on firms specifically. Yes. Uh, so, so uh, uh, those facts are from a work in progress paper, and those are exactly some of the questions that we are looking at. We know the obvious things that you know. Uh, there's a lot of variation by firm size, uh, but that's kind of already well known. It varies very monotonically with that. Um, but right now, actually, we are in the process of writing and running some code to look at exactly. Uh, deeper at the characteristics of such firms and 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 so on. <clears throat> so stay tuned. That's my answer. <clears throat> uh, one more question. Over there. I have a question about the uh, the I, I can, I, you know, I, I, I can try to talk about what I think are some potential implications of uh, what we found about trends in inequality, in particular wealth inequality in the U.S. I think there are two things. One thing is that if you look at history, it's clear that progressive uh, capital taxation is a very powerful way to affect the wealth distribution. So in, for a very long time, the US had top estate tax rates of uh, 90%, top marginal income tax rate of 90%, higher tax rates on capital income than on labor income. And presumably, this has played a, a key role in uh, reducing the very top wealth shares. But that's not going to you know, 
So then, you know, all, 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 all of this, you know, all of these extra taxes, you know, that's not an end in itself, you know, to tax the, the top 1% that can help to, you know, cut taxes for uh, the middle class and, and increase transfers for uh, uh, relatively poor people. Now, there, there's another aspect that I'd like to emphasize, you know, beyond progressive taxation, I think progressive taxation would not, would not be enough in the sense that what, what, what I showed is that the saving rate for the bottom 90% is, you know, extremely small and negative. Now, you know, if the saving rate remains 0%, whatever the income share of the bottom 90%, its wealth will converge to zero, okay? So you need to invent ways to encourage saving at the bottom and middle class saving. Now, how, how do you do that? You know, that's, uh, that's not so easy. So yeah, there are proposals, for instance, for automatic uh, IRA, you know, individual retirement accounts, automatic contributions to pension accounts, and so on. Uh, I think, you know, getting back to the question of, you know, what, what, what does that teach us about capitalism and everything, what, one concrete proposal would be, you know, to direct automatically a small fraction of earnings to a, you know, sovereign wealth fund or a broad-based, you know, fund managed by, you know, the US government, for instance, that would earn a very, you know, that would earn a pretty high rate of return, and so that would, in particular, address this uh, fact that yes, you know, that there is a gradient in rate of returns and, and rich people do get higher rates of returns than, than less wealthy uh, individuals. And so there is a scope for rethinking, you know, the exact frontier between public wealth and, and private wealth, okay? With some automatic saving put into a sovereign wealth fund that would guarantee a, a, a decent rate of return. I think that could have in the long run a, a, a high impact on the wealth of, of the middle class. I think that's a good point to stop. We're right about on time, and so that's a good time for a coffee break. <laughs>